Okay, well, hi. My name is Jelle van Zand, and uh, well, thank you very much for having me on this day. Um, I really look forward to my talk. Um, I will start a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Jelle van Zand, as they said, a Dutch student of the VHL University of Applied Sciences. And I'm mostly interested in spontaneous forest dynamics and forests that are left alone. As when I came to my university in the first year, I always had the idea that nature was wild. Nature was nature. It was ruled by nature and natural processes. And when I started my studies, I actually found out that that was not the case exactly. Um, um, so I was immediately starting to think, how can I um, contribute to the wild nature within the Netherlands, a very fragmented forested land and uh, so I came across the Wageningen University and Research Center and allowed uh, the, the researcher to have a talk with me and um, yeah um, that's how I came to be uh, the new researcher at the, at the Dutch Forest Reserve program for four months and um, well I want to start by my first slide um, Okay, let's see for a bit. All right, yes. So, um, as you can see on the slide, this is the picture of- Hi, sorry, Yella, sorry to interrupt. We can't see your slide, unfortunately. Um, okay. This one, so if you try pressing on Zoom, there should be a share screen button, a green share screen button at the bottom of your, um, your screen. So if you'd like to click on that, and that should be able to bring the presentation. I can't see to find it right in here. I. Um, it was it was just there on the previous call with the Wilderness Society. However, hmm. Hi, Yella, give us a minute. We will pull it up from our side and then we'll guide you through your own presentation. Thank you very much, Yunus. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, well, as we, um, as we wait for a bit, we can already talk uh, a little bit uh, of an introduction about the Dutch Forest Reserve. Um, after the introduction, I will talk about the history of wilderness in the Netherlands, especially forests in the Holocene, um, the need to establish strict forest reserves in the, in the Netherlands, their status of protection nowadays, uh, a case study where I've researched um, one of the um, forest reserves that hasn't been managed for over 25 years. So we're looking at natural processes taking place um, and how it will shape the species composition and the structure of a forest. Um, and as a last part, I want to talk about forest reserves as a tool to protect wilderness. Um, is the PowerPoint presentation ready or? The presentation will be up in two seconds. So Perfect. bear with me, sorry. Perfect, no problem at all, no problem at all. We'll get it up for you in two seconds. Sure, sure. So, yeah. The, well, okay. The, um, um, the Ministry of Agriculture and Nature in the 1983 activated the Dutch Forest Reserve Program over 25 years ago. Um, they handed it over to Wageningen University and Research because of their specialization in forest ecology and management within the Netherlands. Um, and well, they fairly range in size. The smallest of them are four hectares all the way to 400 hectares. Um, very different communities. We have a lot of large communities will be the nutrient poor pine forests, mostly of the east and the south of the Netherlands. And I started sharing. Perfect. And I can move it now or are so, you going to do that? So yeah, when you're ready to move the screen, just give me a, a note and I'll, I'll move it for you. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. Well, um, 
a little bit about the first um, the first picture. It shows really the, um, the strength, in my opinion, of forest reserves. We see uh, a pine forest, and after 25 years, we see the regeneration of pedunculate oak, Quercus robur, right in the forest. And I think it's a really powerful picture where you see the young oak standing out of the out of the pine forest and becoming the next generation of broadleaf native trees in the Netherlands. Um, next slide, please. Okay, well, here you can see a little bit about the spatial distribution of forest reserves in the Netherlands. All the green dots that you see along the screen are forest reserves. Um, you can see in the eastern parts and in the southern parts, the more lighter orange kind of color, um, which represents the really nutrient poor uh, sandy soils of the Netherlands. And as we're gonna see in the next slide, uh, this will be where the maximum amount of forest in the Netherlands are present. Uh, so a little bit more about the Netherlands as a whole. Um, on the western side, all the way to the north, you can see the kind of pinkish color, which is really rich and uh, rich sediment in the form of clay uh, by the sea. As you can see, most forest reserves are not there. We only have one in southern Holland. Um, and as you can see in the east, in the lightest color, we have a lot of them. So it's a little bit misrepresented. Uh, we mostly have the poor sandy communities and we actually do not have any knowledge about richer forests. Um, they consist mostly of elm, of ash, more hardwood trees that are really uh, not present that much within a forested area in the Netherlands. Um, Okay, next uh, slide, please. So a little bit about the land use in the Netherlands. As I said, in the middle, you can see a, a hard territory of forest, mostly forest. Within the forest, you can see it's nature and those are mostly open heatlands. Um, but everywhere else is or agriculture, more than 70% of our country or cities, almost 10% of our country. Uh, forest as well, their forest and nature, so to speak, are a little bit over 11% of all the land use in the Netherlands. So we're dealing about really fragmented forested with a large area right in the middle, the Veluwe, the Veluwe area. Um, this is also where the forest reserve that I've researched uh, was present, but most of the forest reserves are, are here. It's the only more or less intact forested system in the Netherlands. Uh, with wolves nowadays as well. So, um, um, okay. Um, the dominated, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the, um, as uh, the Netherlands is dominated by agriculture, uh, we can see not only no forest, but also a lot of effect on those forests. Nitrogen overloads are one of the most severe ones but we can also talk about air pollution and water pollution, uh, which the Netherlands is almost quite the lowest one on the ranking in, in Europe. So that is a really hard problem. We see conflicts of um, trees, old oaks dying, just dying off because of uh, the acidification that is going on. We see birds uh, already with broken legs out of their, out of their eggshells uh, because there's not enough calcium. Of course, the latest studies of um, the tremendous uh, downfall of uh, insects in Northwestern Europe is also taking place here. Also in the nature reserves, more than 78% decline in some species groups. Um, there just isn't enough cal uh, calcium and everything that is is broken down on most soils, except for the soils on the borders who are really uh, more rich because of their history as a uh, as a previous river. Uh, so next slide, please. As you can see here is a, a drawing of uh, uh, not a forest, but a open landscape within the Holocene. And actually uh, we think of the Netherlands as a really densely forested area, but um, agriculture has been there for over eight or 7,000 years in the south of the Netherlands. The Neolithic people 
already started cutting down forests that more better soils, more um, yeah, nutrient rich soils in the south of the Netherlands. And as we um, move into time, we see the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, which brings even more cattle uh, to the Netherlands, especially cattle farmers across the Germanic and the Celtic world are really present. And um, uh, however, due to the quite open landscape, we can still see, as you see, a brown bear, a bear, eagles, um, and lots of uh, lots of big megafauna who is still present and living together in the same community as those humans of the early days are. Um, yeah, okay, and next slide, please. Um, well, here on the left, it's in Dutch, however, you can see um, the archaeobotanic um, development of the Netherlands. Right after the last ice age, down uh, after the old dryas, there's uh, trees start to grow again. And we can still, um, we can see again, since a, a long time, forest of birch and pine, really um, forest uh, covering almost all of the Netherlands. All hunter-gatherers communities are mostly use them for uh, burning. Um, and as we develop into the time, right across when we come to the new Stone Age or the Neolithic, when the first farmers start to enter, we see grains um, and other agricultural uh, products arriving in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, from this moment on, the um, uh, forest that used to exist, consisting of lime, of oak, of elm, started to decline really fast. Um, first, only in the south of the Netherlands, the red area that you see over there, the first settlements, and then they moved up to the river, the bluish area, all the way to the central, and from there on spread out. Um, as you can see in 5,500 uh, or 7,500 years ago, we can see that the yellow kind of color, it's all sandy soils in most of the Netherlands. The green area on the left is the clay kind of soils. And um, um, they are not home to forest uh, because of the tide is just too strong and the natural, natural processes only uh, give small herbs a chance who can continue their growth and reproduce within one year. Um, the rest is all sand. As we go to 2750 before Christ, so 4750 years ago, the brownish area becomes way more dominant. This is actually a peat that is forming because of the sea rise that is going on. Um, and over there we have some forest, but mostly uh, consisting of almond species and birch species. Um, as you can see on the left part, at 2750 before Christ, we are seeing the uh, beach entering the Netherlands, uh, which is actually um, um, a point of change in the Netherlands for forest communities, who always depended on light species like oak, like elm, uh, they, um, the beach was really, um, yeah, a, a real fight for them to struggle for existence. And um, after that, we can see all areas except the most nutrient poor areas consisting of beach in the Netherlands in the eastern and southern parts uh, of the country. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, This is actually um, the growth place of the lost primeval forest in the Netherlands, so to speak. Uh, Beekbergewald. 1871, it got locked down uh, or uh, completely locked. And uh, we speak of this is our last primeval forest of the Netherlands. Um, but actually, uh, after the Middle Ages, they were already all gone. This is a a fine example of it, who has long been used for coppicing um, and for uh, animal husbandry within the forested area. So even before it got cut down, 
we didn't have any primeval forest left in the Netherlands for ages already. Um, however, this is Big Berg about restoration project, which is a really nice project. Um, it, um, it looks to reforest this area, who was once agriculture, um, and um, they use uh, real Dutch trees for it, so to speak. So the real uh, populations from the Netherlands uh, as they arrive from the Ice Age, because more than 90% of Dutch trees are mostly imported actually from areas like Germany, Sweden, and France and other European countries because, well, we were all out of trees basically. And uh, so these are the really, um, yeah, really fine examples of it. The seed is collected and uh, here it's re-sprouted and uh, yeah, we see a really nice area uh, coming into life again. Um, um, yeah. Next slide, please, uh, again. Okay, so now we're here. The need to establish strict forest reserves in today's society. As I was said before, it all started uh, way back into the Middle Ages. Uh, overgrazing of sheep turned most of our uh, forested lands into heaths and sand dunes who were just um, so uh, poor that most trees couldn't grow there and the ones who did just got grazed away. Um, after the um, introduction of uh, wool from Australia and New Zealand, um, there wasn't much uh, worth anymore in most of the sheep. So we, um, we started to, um, to plant the heats and the drifting sands with pines. Pines who are now the most dominant tree in the Netherlands uh, by far, um, started to rejuvenate on their own on the on the open heats and, and sand yeah soils um, okay next slide please as we come closer to our age 1983 as I said before um, the most uh, the best reason to start, the strict forest preserve program is because we actually, because all of the ages without forests, we had no idea about natural processes, structures, species composition within natural forests, um, how they can be managed uh, and following nature as a principle instead of just uh, clear cutting. Um, these were answers that the Ministry of Agriculture and Nature, uh, yeah, they wanted to, to find out and they're um, the key reasons were the conservation of these biotic societies, uh, for example, in uh, oak birch society with a lot of plants and native animals uh, belonging to it, and um, to uh, capture more of the sense of um, is human influence necessary within forest or when it is actually not. And uh, we try to see those differences and um, to, to figure out which forest we should manage and which forest we, we shouldn't. Okay, so um, as you can see here on this, uh, on this picture, you can see windblown uh, oak forest within the Netherlands. who are just sprouting out on top again, forming a really nice open place within an actually structure poor forest. So yeah, this is the kind of things that we want to gain more insight in and um, yeah, be aware of in, within our management, not only for uh, wood supplies, but especially for nature conservation, of course. Um, well, next slide, please. Um, so the status of, of protection. Uh, here you can see uh, me working with two of the colleagues of Wageningen University in research. Actually, I'm standing here with my pockets in my hand, but I was working, I will promise you. Um, and um, here you can actually um, see the problem of the protection of, of, or the status of the forest reserves. 
since 2004, our new government has decided to stop funding the forest reserve program. So over 60 forest reserves installed, over thousands of hectares. Um, well, they're actually uh, not researched and there is no active communication from governments or from Wageningen University to these landowners. And well, they're in their eyes, their ground is just there. They cannot use it by law and uh, nothing seems to do anything with it. Well, you can probably understand that this brings a lot of friction um, for landowners. So um, as we discovered um, last year, there were some, uh, well, actually illegal uh, shooting facilities within the forest reserve program. And they just said, yeah, we have new management. And actually we did not know uh, that this was a forest preserve to start with. And um, no one told us ever there, we've seen no one. So goodwill, it's not a thing that you um, reach with this, of course. Um, and um, additional feeding was also found, of course, which results in a very unnatural species composition. There are red deer, roe deer uh, present in the area, a lot of wild boar, uh, wolf territory next to it. Uh, but if you feed all the herbivores right within that patch, the forest structure and species composition will be really changed uh, by all of this uh, additional feeding. Um, okay, um, next slide, please. Um, so now we're going to talk a bit about uh, the Tongerensai on the Veluwe, as I said before, the North Veluwe, a really poor and nutrient uh, uh, community. And as you can see here, we see a lot of pines that are already dead and falling, uh, mostly caused by wind, but also just by, dr by drought. Um, a really nice uh, oak uh, right in the middle um, shows that broadleaf trees are uh, rejuvenating within the open pine forest as it is uh, nowadays. Well, uh, the Tongere Sahai, 40 hectares, quite small, actually, but um, uh, big enough to, yeah, to do, uh, to give fairly good estimations of what is happening there. Um, well, the history, uh, the Netherlands is uh, purely uh, dominated by Scots Pine, of course, but what is special about this area is that it is um, uh, spontaneously rejuvenation that has going, been going on here since the 1870s. So this was a a really large and vast area of heat land, uh, which was naturally due to land abandon abandonment was converted to forest, mostly pine, because they rejuvenate really nice in open soils and uh, not too much uh, humus uh, in the soils. So um, it is really a structure rich pine forest. Uh, we have pines of over 60 centimeters in diameter and 70 until really small ones and they're all in together in groups individual really lowly branched out so they look really powerful and they're they can be over 150 years old um, due to this open spots will start to form within the forest um, which will allow sunlight of course to reach the forest floor this will warm up and this process will exhilarate the soil decomposition within that forest. Um, so in, uh, next slide, please. So, so here we can see a distribution diameter class of Scots pine, Pinus sylvestris, um, and their uh, individuals per hectare, both in 1994, shown in blue, and 2090, shown in orange. Um, so as you can see, the, um, in 1994, all of, the for, all of the trees within the forest belonged to Pinus sylvestris, all of them. There was no uh, broadleaf tree there um, big enough uh, to be seen as a tree, so over 50 centimeters tall. Um, and yeah, um, as we can see, when we go to 2019 in the orange, 
we see the forest, of course, getting older. Their diameters are getting much bigger. Um, but as we can also see, uh, in 2090, in the lower uh, diameter classes, Scott's pine is not present at all. It's, it's not there and it's, it has been showing a decline uh, for a long time. Um, so this means Scott's pine is not rejuvenating within this forest. Um, okay, uh, next uh, slide, please. So after 25 years, this is the kind of example that, that we can see. Um, in uh, blue is still the Scott's pine present. Orange is pedunculate oak, Quercus robur. Uh, green is betula pendula, uh, birch, silver birch. And uh, we can have some more uh, American uh, birch cherry, some beech, and even some Japanese larch within the system. Um, but most importantly is that um, after 25 years of management, tree diversity is now five times as big, although they're not all um, species that belong to the Netherlands, of course, or which are native here. Um, uh, but um, Uh, pedunculate oak and silver birch completely dominate the lower grow classes. Um, this is, um, they form now 95% of the newly added spontaneously rejuvenated trees within the system. So we can see a tendency moving from pine forests to new uh, pedunculate oak and silver birch coming into the system and uh, colonizing it. Uh, for the first time in ages. Um, oh, I see the, uh, oh yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, well, the, this, you can think now, well, there's just two more trees. What is, what is that for biodiversity? I mean, now there are three native trees or four, but um, Scott's pine is home to 172 native insects and oak has over 400. Silver birch also has over 270 native species who are herbivore insects eating off the leaves of those two trees. So it is a tremendous uh, increase in biodiversity within this forest, exactly, or especially for the, um, the lower classes and which will benefit, of course, a highly rich bird life. Um, so, um, Um, yeah, okay, so the, um, the thing that, what has happened here now? We have, all of a sudden, we have three uh, after ages, or at least after decades, um, we don't see any native broadleaf trees emerging in the system, none. And only after 100, over 100 years of, of pine forest, trees start to broadleaf trees start to colonize. So how is this possible? Why not any sooner? Um, why not later? What, what, what is going on here? Um, well, as we uh, seem to know a lot about, about natural processes, of course, um, especially herbivory gets a lot of attention. Uh, soil development is actually um, just as important as a natural process for a system. Uh, what you can see here all has to do with soil development. See, um, uh, imagine a pine forest. We have growing there for a lot of years. So after 40 years, those uh, a thick layer of, of, um, of pine uh, uh, leaves are forming there. In, because of the nutrient poor system, there's not a lot of uh, small uh, fauna within uh, within the soil that breaks it down or fungi that breaks it down, um, but we can, uh, it will slowly degrade. After 40 years, the first kind of dwarf shrubs like blueberry or crowberry and certain grasses will start to colonize the area as well. And um, blueberry as a, as a really advantage of growing a lot bigger, overshading the grasses and crowberries. Thick mats of grasses are now dying off, leaving um, leaving really nice uh, open spots of, of soil after 80 years. 
So this now, at this time, broadleaves take their time, take their chance to, to colonize this system. Um, okay, uh, next uh, slide, please. So forest reserves as a tool to protect wilderness, as I said, uh, the largest um, reserve is only 400 hectares. Um, is this enough? Is this sufficient enough at protecting wild nature in the Netherlands that we have left um, or try to uh, re-emerge? Um, I've heard a lot about the implementation of forest reserves in Belgium, both strict and non-strict forest reserves, uh, with the difference being between strict or being doing nothing and non-strict uh, removing exotic species, for an example, uh, to create a more diverse uh, society. And um, yeah, I'm really curious to the idea of implementation of forest reserves in your country as well. And uh, again, thank you very much uh, for listening and for your time. And uh, well, thank you that I could be here. Great, thank you very much for your contribution, Yellow, on the Dutch forest reserves. Sure.